Uh, you mentioned the next version of Llama. What can you say about the next version of Llama? What, uh, what what can you say about like what uh, what were you working on in terms of release, in terms of the vision for that? Well, a lot of what we're doing is taking the first version, which was primarily you know this research version, and trying to now build a version that has all of the latest state of the art safety precautions built in, um, and and we're um, we're using some more data to train it. Um, from across our services, but but a lot of the the work that we're doing internally is really just focused on making sure that this is um, you know as aligned and responsible as as possible. And you know we're building a lot of our own. You know we're talking about kind of the open source infrastructure, but you know the the main thing that we focus on building here, are, you know, a lot of product experiences to help people connect and express themselves. So you know we're gonna I've t- I've talked about a bunch of this stuff. But um, then you'll have, you know, an assistant that you can talk to in WhatsApp. Um, you know, I think I, I think in the future every creator will will have kind of an AI agent that can kind of act on their behalf that their fans can talk to. I I, I want to get to the point where every small business basically has an AI agent that people can talk to for you know to do commerce and customer support and things like that. So there are going to be all these different things, and. Llama or the language model underlying this is is basically going to be the engine that powers that. The reason to open source it is that um, as as we did with um, with the the first version, is that it uh, you know basically it, it unlocks a lot of innovation in the ecosystem. We'll we'll make our products better as well, um, and also gives us a lot of valuable feedback on security and safety, which is important for making this good. But yeah, I mean the, the the work that we're doing to advance the infrastructure, it's um, it's basically at this point taking it beyond a research project into something which is ready to be kind of core infrastructure, not only for our own products, but um, you know, hopefully for for a lot of other things out there too. Do you think the llama or the language model underlying that version two will be open sourced? Do you, do you're do you have internal debate around that, the pros and cons, and so on? This is, I mean, we were talking about the debates that we have internally, and I think, um, I think the question is how to do it, mm. right? I mean, it's, I, I think we, you know, we we did the research license for V one, and and I think the 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 big thing that we're that we're thinking about is is basically like what's the what's the right the right way. So there was a leak that happened. I don't know if you can comment on it for V one. You know, we released it as a research project. Um, for researchers to be able to use. Mm. But in doing so, we put it out there. So, um, you know, we were very clear that anyone who uses the the code and the weights doesn't have a commercial license to put into products. And we've we've generally seen people respect that, right? It's like you don't have you know, any reputable companies that are basically trying to put this into into um, their commercial products. But but yeah, but by sharing it with, you know, so many researchers, it's, it's you know, it, yeah. it did leave the building. But uh, what have you learned from that process that you might be able to apply to V2 about how to release it safely, effectively, uh, if, yeah. if you release it? Yeah, well, I mean, I think a lot of the feedback, like I said, is just around, you know, different things around, you know, how do you fine tune models to make them more aligned and safer? And you see all the different data recipes that, um, you, know, you mentioned a lot of different projects that are based on this. I mean, there's one at Berkeley. There's you know, it's just like all over, and um, and people have tried a lot of different things, and we've tried a bunch of stuff internally. So, kind of where we're we're making progress here, but also we're able to learn from some of the best ideas in the community. And you know, I think it. You know, we want to just continue continue pushing that forward, but so like but I, I don't have any news to announce on, oh, on, right. on, on this, right. if, that, if that's if that's what you're you're asking. Right. I mean, this is a a thing that we're uh, we're still we're still kind of you know actively working through the 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 right way to move forward here. The details of the secret sauce are still being developed. I see. Uh, can you comment on what do you think of? Uh, the thing that worked for GPT, which is the reinforcement learning with human feedback. So doing this alignment process, do you find it interesting? And as part of that, let me ask, because I talked to Jan LeCun before talking to you today, he asked me to ask, or suggested that I ask, do you think LLM fine tuning will need to be crowdsourced Wikipedia style? 
So crowdsourcing. So this kind of idea of how to integrate the human in the fine tuning of these foundation models. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea that I've talked to Jan about a bunch. Um, and you know, we were talking about how do you basically train these models to be as as safe and, and aligned and responsible as possible. And you know, different groups out there who are doing development test different data recipes in fine tuning. But th this idea that you, that you just mentioned is that at the end of the day, instead of having kind of one group fine tune some stuff and then another group, you know, produce a different fine tuning recipe and then mm -hmm. us trying to figure out which one we think works best to produce the most aligned model. Um, I, I do think that it would be nice if you could get to a point where you had a Wikipedia style collaborative way for a, a kind of a broader community to um to to fine tune it as well now there's a lot of challenges in that both from an infrastructure and like a community management and product mm -hmm. perspective about how you do that so i i haven't worked that out yet well, um, just, but but i as an idea i think it's it's quite compelling and i think it it goes well with the ethos of open sourcing the technology is also finding a way to have a, a kind of community driven um a community driven training of it um but i think that there are a lot of questions on this in, in general these this these questions around what's the the best way to produce aligned ai models it's very much a research area and it's one that i think we will need to make as much progress on as the kind of core intelligence capability of the of the um the models themselves well i, I just did a conversation with jimmy wales the founder of wikipedia and to me wikipedia is one of the greatest websites ever created and is a kind of a miracle that it works. And I think it has to do with something that you mentioned, which is community. You have a small community of editors that somehow work together well. And they uh, they handle very controversial topics and they handle it with balance and with grace, despite sort of the um, attacks that will often happen. A lot of the time. I mean, it's not, it's, it has issues just like any other human system, but yes, I mean, the balance is, I mean, it's a, it's amazing what they've been able to achieve, but it's, it's also not perfect. And I think that that's, um, there's still a lot of challenges. Right. It's, uh, the more controversial the topic, the more, the more difficult, uh, the, um, the journey towards quote unquote truth or knowledge or wisdom that Wikipedia tries to capture in the same way AI models, we need to be able to generate those same things, truth, knowledge, and wisdom. And how do you align those models that they generate um, something that uh, is closest to truth? There's these concerns about misinformation, all this kind of stuff that nobody can define. And it's, a, it's a something that we together as a human species have to define, like what is truth? and how to help AI systems generate that. Because one of the things language models do really well is generate convincing sounding things that can be completely wrong. <laughs> and so how do you align it uh, to be less wrong? And part of that is the training and part of that is the alignment. And however you do the alignment stage. And just like you said, it's a very new and a very open research problem. Yeah. And I think that there's also a lot of questions about whether the current architecture for LLMs, as you continue scaling it, what happens? Um, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of what's been exciting in the last year is that there was there's clearly a qualitative breakthrough where you know with with some of the GPT models um, that OpenAI put out and and that others have been able to do as well. I, I think it reached a kind of level of quality where people are like, wow, this is this feels different and um, and like it's going to be able to be the foundation for building a lot of awesome products and experiences and value. But I think that the other realization that people have is, wow, we just made a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. um, if there are other breakthroughs quickly, then I think that there's the sense that maybe we're we're closer to general intelligence. But I think that that, that idea is predicated on the idea that I think people believe that there's still generally a bunch of additional breakthroughs to make and that it's, um, we just don't know 
how long it's going to take to get there. And you know, one view that some people have, um, this doesn't tend to be my view as much, is that simply scaling the current LLMs and you know getting to higher parameter count models by itself will will get to something that is closer to um, to to general intelligence. But um, I don't know. I, I tend to think that there's probably more more um, fundamental steps that need to be taken along the way there. But still, the leaps taken with this extra alignment step is quite incredible, quite surprising to to a lot of folks. And on top of that, when you start to have hundreds of millions of people potentially using a product that integrates that, you can start to see civilization transforming effects before you achieve super, quote unquote, super intelligence. It could be super transformative without being a super intelligence. Oh yeah, I mean, I think that there are gonna be a lot of amazing products and value that can be created with the current level of technology. Um, to some degree, you know, I'm excited to work on a lot of those products over the next few years, and I think it would just create a tremendous amount of whiplash if the number of breakthroughs keeps, like if, if, if there keep on being stacked breakthroughs, because I think to some degree, industry in the world needs some time to kind of build these breakthroughs into the products and experiences that we all use so we can actually benefit from them. Um, but I, I don't know. I think that there's just a, a, a like an awesome amount of stuff to do. I mean, I think about like all of the, I don't know, small businesses or individual entrepreneurs out there who um, you know, now we're going to be able to you know, get help coding the things that they need to go build things or designing the things that they need, or um, we'll be able to, you know, use these models to be able to do customer support for the people that they're that they're serving, you know, over WhatsApp without having to, you know, it's, it, I, I think that that's that's just going to be. I, I just think that this is all going to be you know, super exciting. It's going to create better better experiences for people and just unlock a ton of innovation and value.